Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. Good evening. Is Dr. Marshner here? Longbeard has arrived. Uh, it's good to be. It's good to be back. Uh, why don't we stand and begin in prayer? Through the prayers of our holy fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, I am going to get to business right away, even though we're starting five minutes late. We're going to let Dr. Marshall go five minutes long, because, you know, don't say no. Yeah, yeah you've got a lot to cover, because we lo- missed out on last week, and he's got to catch up, because we're not going to be able to uh, extend the, the series out, so... We're going to do four parts in three parts, if you will. And, uh, and so that's it. That's it. It's good to be back with you. Please welcome Longbeard, Dr. William Marshner. I Longobardi. Those are the barbarians who settled northern Italy. Name eventually shortened to Lombards, right? Well, I've never been called one of those before, but uh, thank you very much, (laughs) dear deacon. (laughs) All right. It is churlish to pick on the title of the series you have been given, but I have a nit to pick with it. It says the road to orthodoxy. That supposes that orthodoxy wasn't really around until the work of these early councils was finished. False. Orthodoxy was there from the beginning. The road to orthodoxy was finished by the year 45, as I tried to argue for you last time, showing you that early Aramaic hymn in Philippians 2, proclaiming our Lord as pre-existent, as incarnate, and as returning to glory. Now his pre-existence in the form of God, which is also in that famous passage, posed the problem of two gods. How make Christ to be, as it says, as the hymn said, in the form of God, without getting as a result two gods? And I tried to point out last time that a clue, at least to the solution of this, was given to the apostles by looking at the 8th chapter of the book of Proverbs, verses 22 and following, where we read that God's wisdom was before all creatures and worked with God in creation. God created everything through his wisdom. This wisdom, thus, is relatively distinct from God the Father. The Father works through it. It's his wisdom. And yet, God the Father and his wisdom are substantially the same. I was able to show this by drawing your attention to the Book of Wisdom, also called the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7, verses 22 to 29 where wisdom is described as having an invisible, purely spiritual, frankly, divine nature. 
So, should the conclusion be from you know, the work that had to be done by about 45 AD to get the preaching of the gospel off the ground, should the conclusion be that Christ <clears throat> is divine because he is the wisdom of God incarnate? Should that be the conclusion? Yes, said St. Paul. In the first chapter of the first theological treatise ever written in the history of the church. It was written in the year 53, okay? maybe even 51. 1 Corinthians is the earliest major epistle. So it's very early in St. Paul's career. He had just begun his missionary journeys in 47 or 48. Now it's a couple of years later. He writes 1 Corinthians, and in that, chapter 1, verse 24, he identifies Christ as the wisdom of God. The power of God and the wisdom of God. Now that nails it down in concrete. The gospel that St. Paul inherited from his predecessors in the church had this identification of Christ in mind. So much for tracing the birth of orthodoxy. Now, I don't say that by the year 53, orthodoxy had every dot, every I dotted and every T crossed, but the main outlines of it were there. I turn now to what we may as well call the road to Nicaea and the work of that council. And to get you started off on the work of that, uh, the road to that council, I want to turn to a second century writer named Athenagoras, like Athens with A G R A G O R A S on the end. Athenagoras. He wrote an apology for the faith in about the year 150. And like most Christian apologies in that early time, the real point of the book was to defend the Christians against charges of criminality. Our defense consisted in showing, look, we are worthy to be tolerated as citizens of the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, we're better citizens than most. And you should not persecute us. In chapter 10, uh, Athenagoras gets into another part of that apology, which is to show that Christianity is not only innocent of crimes, but also represents what we may as well call a thinking man's religion. Here's how the part I'm interested in goes. Athenagoras writes, we also admit the Son of God. And don't tell me it's ridiculous that God should have a Son. For we do not conceive God the Father and God the Son after the fashion of the poets. Dot, dot, dot. Let me stop a minute. What poets is he talking about? Who said he's it? Good for you. Homer and Hesiod, H-E-S-I-O-D, Hesiod, wrote a book called The Coming to Be of the Gods, Theogony, in which he gives you the whole mythological story about how everything was all mixed up and then somehow the heavens got to be above the earth. And first thing you know, the heavens and the earth had some sort of cosmic interchange. And as a result of their union, many gods and titans and so on were born. In Hesiod, of course, as in the rest of Greek mythology, when, god has a, when a god has a son, it's another god. So if you have multiple gods with their sisters and their cousins and their aunts, there get to be plenty of gods. Well... Uh, Athenagoras says, we're not like that. Not at all. Rather, I continue now the quote, the Son of God is the Word 
of the Father in idea and in power. Remember John 1. In the beginning was the Logos. Last time I connected the title Logos with the title Wisdom of God. So he's the wisdom of God in power, in idea and in power, since through him all things have been made, the Father and the Son being but one. The point that the Father and the Son are but one is from St. John's Gospel, where Jesus says, I and the Father are one. The word of the Father in idea and in power. Now, I'm not finished this quote yet, but I want to take another brief break to explain another feature of this text. Let's see. Here we have the writing board. And let us see if either of these actually works. Among ancient philosophers, there was a school called the Stoic School, because they originally preached from a porch, a Stoa. They were called the Stoics, and they were more interested in philosophy of language than any other ancient philosophers. So they did an analysis of the talk of a word, and they divided the talk of a word into two. There was the inner word and the spoken word. By the inner word, they call it the logos and diathetikos. It's the word that stays in your mind. Okay? When you speak to somebody, share your thought with somebody, you pronounce a word, and that's the logos proforikos, the spoken word. Does everybody get the difference? Now, the one thing that I better point out to you is that by inner word, the Stoics did not mean imaginary speech. Okay? I know that when your mouth is not moving, you often have a stream of language going through your mind. That's imaginary speech. What they meant by the inner word was not that, but the concept behind it. Okay? It's abstract, it's mental, it's a pure concept, it's not yet in words at all, it comes into words, maybe first in the mind, then on the tongue. But the inner word is the concept, according to Stoic philosophy, and we have, by the way, the same ideas in the philosophy of language pretty much to this day. All right, so, Athenagoras is saying that the Son of God is the, the Father's inner word, the word in idea, the concept, okay, and in power. Since through him all things have been made, the Father and the Son being but one. I continue the quote. The Son is in the Father, and the Father is in the Son by the unity and power of the Spirit. That's another quotation from John's Gospel. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. All right. Then he says, the Son of God is the intelligence and word of the Father. The intelligence, the wisdom, the logos, equivalent ideas. The Son of God is the intelligence and word of the Father. And if in your high wisdom you wish to know what the word son means, I'll tell you briefly, he says. He was the offspring of the father. Not, however, in the sense that he was produced. He's the offspring of the father, but not in the sense that he was produced. Right? And then he attaches an explanation. Because... God, from the beginning, being an eternal intelligence, had his word with him. Okay? Since he is eternally reason endowed, logikos. Okay? 
So there is Athenagoras understanding that if by the wisdom of God you mean something really sublime, like his inner concept or inner word, you cannot mean something created. Because God, being eternally intelligent, has always had his word with him. All right? Good. So far, very good. Thank you, Athenagoras. But he became a son in being pronounced. In order that in all material things there might be idea and energy among them coming from without. Oh, now here's a new idea, and not a very good one. All right. Athenagoras, like several other apologists in the second century, distinguished the status of our Lord as word from his status as son. Okay? They admitted, and this is crucial for orthodoxy, they admitted that as the word, he was eternally with the Father, being in the Father from all eternity. All right? But as son, ah, there they thought a different explanation was needed. Okay? And the idea they hit upon is the idea that an inner word becomes a son when it's spoken. The pronunciation is the birth of the word. This is not the orthodoxy we learned in the catechism. And for good reason. It is a mistake. Okay? And you can see the mistake immediately when you ask yourself the question, all right, if the word at some point back there was spoken, when was that? Well, you find the answer in Genesis 1. Okay? God speaks. He says, let there be light. Aha, uh -huh, and there was light. Let there be this, let there be that. So that's the spoken word, and it is pronounced at creation. So Jesus Christ the Lord has always been God's word and is of the divine nature as God's word, but only at the point of creation did he come forth as a son. Now this is exactly where Arius will pounce. As I say, there were other second century, even third century uh, apologists who made the same mistake. Justin Martyr made this mistake. Even the great African, uh, well, lawyer and ecclesiastical writer Tertullian made this mistake. He says that our Lord has always been word, but not always son. He became son when God spoke him. Now, please note, this gives this theory, which we now reject, all of us, this theory would give the spoken word a peculiar status with respect to time and creation. It would be that through which God creates all things, because he does create through his spoken word, that makes sense, okay, so it creates through it, but it is not exactly created itself, is it? And yet it, is it isn't eternal. Because the universe of creatures has not always existed. So God cannot have been saying, let there be, from all eternity. And yet, the spoken word isn't exactly in time either, because... Time is inside creation. Time is a measure of change among created things, right? So he's sort of right before creation. A minute before creation, no. That's letting time leak out of creation. You don't want to do that. But you see what a funny status this creates. Now, as we will see, 
in due time. This is where Arius struck. And then, to make matters worse, Athenagoras finishes this chapter of his apology by saying, okay, the son is spoken as, a wor- as, as, uh, as the son. I mean, the word is spoken, becomes the son thereby, and introduces order and intelligibility into things from without. All right? This is what the prophetic spirit teaches. Quote, the Lord created me to be the beginning of his ways in the accomplishment of his works. Unquote. Now, somebody brought up last time the problem with the translations we were looking at of Proverbs 8. Verse 22 begins, The Lord established me at the beginning of his ways. In Hebrew, the Lord hakani. Maybe two Q's, but never mind. H-Q-N. The Lord set me up at the beginning of his ways from the root Q-N-N. The Greeks, translating this passage into the Septuagint, translated this verb as um, ektisen, which is created. Ktizo in Greek is to create. So the Greek has it, the Lord created me at the beginning of his ways. All right. Now, Athenagoras is quoting it that way. After all, the Septuagint is the only Bible he knows. But please note, he's not taking the word created in a strict sense. We have seen him deny that the Son is a creature. Okay? He's not a creature. He's that through which all the creatures were made. So he's taking the word create here in a loose sense. Many of the fathers of the church would do that. Arius, however, will soon be along and make the sense strict. So I'm pointing out to you at the end of this mostly pretty good passage here from the second century, a mistake which is going to produce trouble down the road. Okay. Before I get to Arius, I have to tell you about another guy. Oh, dear. Are our clergy here tonight? Okay, good. (laughs) Because I have to tell you that this troublemaker who came before Arius was absolutely from Antioch. He was the bishop of Antioch. Okay. And he's bishop there about the year 260 A.D. And his name was Paul, Bishop Paul. We'll start up here. P-A-U-L. Of, and then they give the little town he was born in. He was born in the town of Samosata. Paul of Samosata. Okay? Think of it as a Japanese corporation. (laughs) Samosata. Little town in Syria from which this guy came. He was Bishop of Antioch. And around the year 260, his teaching attracted the attention of other bishops from the surrounding areas. They gathered together in a synod. They condemned his doctrines and deposed him from the Sea of Antioch. Okay. What what had he done wrong? What had been his mistakes? All right. When you read about this in the history books, you, you, you find his heresy a bit hard to understand. But I'm going to try to make it crystal clear to you. Okay. Paul of Samosata seriously believed 
that when we called the Lord Jesus the word of God, we meant a spoken word. Yes. There is no word of God except the spoken word, according to Paul of Samosata. Okay. So, in other words, the Son of God is um, a speech act. When God says at the beginning, let there be light, that is the Son. That speaking is the Son. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. So, Christ is pronounced at creation all right. But then, a funny thing happens. If you think about the creation story, it must strike you as wonderful that when God speaks, the effect appears. God says, let there be light, and there was light. So imagine now the idea of a word the same sort of word that takes flesh. God says, be man. And that commandment becomes a human being. Uh So that's his Christology. From a divine point of view, the word is a speech act of God, a commandment. Okay? What he becomes in self-fulfillment of the commandment is a human being. He's just a human being. And then the Holy Spirit, says this same Paul of Samosata, is the grace in souls. Okay? God gives a command for his son to take flesh. The flesh appears as a human being named Jesus. He commands uh, grace in souls. There they are. There it is. That's the Holy Spirit. Now, when I first read about this guy, um, I have a confession to make. I thought, by George, he should have been born in about 1915 in Holland, because this is Edward Skillebex. Yeah. Well, never mind. I hope none of you has ever read Edward Skillebex. I don't recommend it. He has gone to his reward now. The only merciful thing about him is he almost only wrote in Dutch. (laughs) So anyway, um, here's the thing. Now, right away, the fellow bishops noticed Paul you're saying that Christ was just a man. You're denying his divinity. And Paul of Samosata would say, oh, not so, because uh, he, he's the divine commandment, become flesh. It's spoken by God, so of course it's divine. But, but Paul, you're not making the son or the word, or whatever, a, a, a divine, you're not giving him any substance of his own. And Paul said, well, he's got his, he becomes man, that's a substance. No, but as God, he's got no substance, is what you're saying, Paul. And he said, oh, well, not to worry about it. Look, I give you a thought experiment. Uh, let's say that we have a speaker named George. And what George does is say hello. Okay? George says hello. How many substances have we got in that sentence? George, yeah. The speaker is the substance. What he does is a speech act. An act is not a substance. Right? But, Paul of Samosata could say, Same with Jesus, same with God's word, the divine commandment. He's not a substance in his own, but there's a substance behind him. 
namely the substance of the speaker. And so, Paul of Samosata defended himself against charges of heresy by saying, look, I'm saying that the Father and the Son are but one substance. Meaning that the only substance in the picture is the substance of the speaker. The word in itself has no substance. And to express this idea, Paul of Samosata invented the word homoousios, of the same substance. The word, the spoken word, is of the same substance as the speaker. <laughs> okay? And the bishops who tried him thought, oh, bad idea, bad word. So the adventures, the intellectual adventures of Paul of Samosata attached to the word same in substance, homo usias, an ill odor in the nostrils of the church. Are you with me? No? <laughs> Paul gave it a bad sense. Okay? He made the word itself a speech act rather than the inner word or divine intelligence or concept. And then... He misused the word of the same substance, homo usios. Misused it. So when he's condemned, the word goes under a cloud, so to speak. Okay. Now then. From 260 to about 285 or 290, the church goes through a profound crisis which mercifully has nothing to do with my story tonight. <laughs> that profound crisis was called Sabellianism. Never mind what it was, but in, well, here's a, here it is in a nutshell. Sabellius said, yeah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You don't want three gods? All right, I got the solution for you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three names for the same thing. They're verbally distinct, but they're just three names for the same thing. Uh-huh. All right. Finally, after many misadventures, Sibelius gets condemned. And blessedly, there is a peaceful possession of orthodoxy in the church at the end of the third century. How do I know that? I know that from a wonderful testimony that we have from the year 295. And I, don't, I didn't put it in the, on the sheet because I ran out of room on the sheet. But I'm going to read it to you. This is a confession of faith published by St. Gregory the Wonder Worker. St. Gregory Thaumaturgos. Gregory the Wonder Worker, he was the bishop of a town in Asia Minor uh, at this time, 295 A.D., Legend has it that this creed was dictated to him by the Blessed Virgin in a vision. And I'm inclined to believe it because this creed is so good. Listen to this. One God, Father of the living word, subsistent wisdom, power, Eternal imprint, who has perfectly begotten a perfect son. Second clause. And in one Lord, unique from the unique, God from God, imprint and image of the divinity, active word, wisdom that maintains the universe, and power that has made creation everywhere, true son of a true father, Invisible from the invisible. Incorruptible from the incorruptible. Um, uh, immortal from the immortal. Eternal from the eternal. That's the second article. Third article. And in one 
Holy Spirit, having his existence from God and having appeared through the Son, image of the Son, perfect from the perfect, life, principle of living things, holiness, which confers sanctification, in whom God the Father manifests himself, who is above all and in all, God and Son, who is spread, I mean, sorry, God the Son, who is spread out over all. Final paragraph. Perfect Trinity, who is neither divided nor alienated in his glory, eternity, and kingship. There is thus in the Trinity nothing created, nothing servile, Nothing introduced from outside. Nothing that would have first not existed and then started to exist. For the Son has never been lacking to the Father, nor to the Holy Spirit, nor the Son to the Holy Spirit. But one and the same Trinity has always remained without change or transformation. Period. That's fantastic. That text deserves to be better known. Okay? So, the heresies had been licked, so to speak, by the time we get to 295, 300. It's great. But, trouble is coming. 17 years after St. Gregory penned that wonderful creed, I hope at the dictation of Our Lady. Seventeen years after that, a funny thing happened at the Milvian Bridge. It's a bridge across the Tiber outside Rome, isn't it? There was a battle there. The commander on the one side was Constantine. Never mind the other guy. <laughs> Constantine wanted victory. He asked for a sign. He was given the sign of the cross in heaven. And he promised that if he won the battle, he would become a Christian. Great. And he did win. This is the year 312. And then, 18 years later, a priest named Arius starts to write and preach in Alexandria, this is now the year 323. Okay. The empire has had, no, I'm sorry, not 18 years, 11 years. The empire has had 11 years to get used to the idea of having a Christian emperor. Persecution all gone bye-bye, no more. Christianity is not yet exactly the state religion, but it's fully tolerated. And the emperor's example makes it powerful at court. And so for the first time, you get a lot of people coming into the church uh, because now it's not a forbidden religion anymore. It's socially acceptable. And uh, one of the people who belongs to this era, I think, is Arius. Well, I know he, tempor temporally he belongs to this era, but I think also in his mentality. Arius comes in like a well-educated young man, looks around, well, let's see, this is the religion of the empire now. Yep, 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 yep. And, uh, but yeah, but yeah, but look at all this doctrinal mess. And then uh, the son, who's not another, and wisdom is, I, I, is, is. Let's fix this up. So Arius comes up with a scheme to fix up the mess of the Trinity. He says, "Look." God is absolutely one, simple, changeless, and therefore God cannot communicate his substance to another. Why not? Well, because this would have to be a division. His substance would have to divide. It sounds like Arius has an amoeba in mind. <laughs> or if there's not a division, there's got to at least be a change. 
and God is changeless. So, nothing other than the one absolute God can be God at all, says Arius. Outside God, there's nothing but creatures. Yeah. However, creatures don't all have to be equally humble. There was a top creature through whom God created all the other creatures. And this creature was his word. Okay? Now, notice, I was arguing before that it's utterly ridiculous to suppose that the inner word of God would be a creature. Because that's his inner concept, his intelligence, his understanding. That can't be created. But once you get the idea that, no, no, maybe, maybe the sun is a speech act, aha, uh, older writers had said, well, that's, that's kind of when the word comes to birth as a son. And Arius says, ha, it's when he comes into being. A word doesn't exist before it's pronounced, hello. So when he's pronounced, he comes to be. And so, said Arius, he's a creature, he's a top creature. And now Arius can go back to Proverbs 8 and to the unfortunate translation of Hakani in verse 22. And he can now take it literally. God created me at the beginning of his ways. Uh Dear me. All right. Is there any... Before I go on with Arius, go back into Hebrew a minute. Is there any justification for taking this verb and translating it with the English to create? And the answer is no. Because Hebrew has a quite distinct verb that means to create. It's used all over the place in Genesis. And that verb is bara, B-A-R-A. That verb is not here. So this does not mean create. The translation that says set me up or established me or even possessed me from the beginning of his ways is better. Well, Arius didn't know any Hebrew. Okay. But taking advantage of this new theory and the fact that the word in the Septuagint is he created me, Arius is ready to roll. The word is the first creature. It gets created when it's spoken. Through that spoken word, all other creatures are made. Fine. God made everything else through the top creature, the sun, the word. Now then, Arius was a good, good, good uh, campaigner. Okay? Uh a PR man before PR had been invented. Um, He knew that the way to spread an idea was to get it to Joe (laughs) Sixpack, if I may put it that way. So he made up ditties to be sung in taverns. Yes. And uh, one of those ditties... um, (laughs) I'm running out of board space here. I'm going to put this in Greek. This is one of Arius' favorite slogans. Ain, there was, pate, a then, hate, when, uk, ain. There was a then when he was not. There was a then when he was not. There was a then. It's even better in Greek. <laughs> Ain't party hardy who can. Ain't party hardy who can. Well, you can see this has a future. Uh, the doctrine spreads very successfully. He had other slogans as well. Uh, for example, he didn't exist before he was born. Uk ain print genetai. Well, that doesn't have the same ring to it. 
But anyway, he, he, he came up with a number of these slogans. And uh, as a result, his doctrine spread, became a little bit popular anyway, at least in the bar rooms of uh, Alexandria. The Bishop of Alexandria, however, was not amused. He was a grave old man who wasted no time at all condemning Arius. Okay? Unfortunately, Arius didn't shut up. Arius had powerful friends. He had friends in the episcopate, old school friends of his, with whom he had studied in Antioch, had now moved up in the hierarchy to become bishops. Arius was still just a parish priest. But he had bishop friends. And those bishop friends would write to Alexandria and say, you, you, you can't condemn my old pal Arius. Well, I was in school with him. He's no heretic. Right. So, the problem didn't end. The, uh, the uproar continued. And it came to the attention of the emperor, who thought that Christianity, with all its settled orthodoxy, would be a wonderful support for the unity of his empire. And now here it was threatened by internal dissensions. And Constantine said, ah, 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 I don't want this. Bishops of the world, get together and fix this. Well, there is a certain respect in which it helps to have the emperor on your side. He could open up the imperial treasury and pay the traveling costs of bishops from all over the Roman world to come to a town called Nicaea. Let's see. You see Constantinople here? Nicaea is down about here. Okay? It's not far from the capital, but uh, a, little way, a little way down and a little way um, west is Nicaea. <coughs> which means victory town. Name after the Greek word Nike, victory. <laughs> but see, we never say Nikea, do we? Well, that's because our language has been subverted by late Latin. The Latin letter C used to be a K. Then it went soft on us. So all kinds of pronunciations have been loused up. It's insufferable. Anyway, <laughs> Constantine pays for all the bishops to go to Nicaea. All right. Now, if it had just been a question at this council of condemning Arius, it would have been over in a day. Okay? There was an overwhelming consensus in favor of an immediate condemnation. No question about it. But the council took longer than a day because the people who were there had to figure out something positive to say. You don't want to just condemn something. You want to put something positive in its place. Some way of stating the matter of our Lord's nature that doesn't invite mistaking him for a creature. Right? Well, that was the sticking point. That took days and days and days of debate. We know all about how the debate went from the um, writings of a young deacon who was there. He had accompanied the Bishop of Alexandria to Nicaea to serve as his secretary. And this young deacon's name was Athanasius. And he wrote up, uh, you know, the, the pro not, not exactly the official proceedings, but a, an account of how the debates had gone at Nicaea. And the trouble is, it was hard to figure out what to say in a positive vein. The bishops tried, look, 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 look. Christ the Savior is from God. Creatures are from nothing. 
So our Lord is from God, not from nothing. The Arians put their heads together and conferred, and they said, oh, well, that's all right. We admit that all things are from God. <laughs> well, how about this? He's not just from God. He, he, he's, he's a power of God, as it said in 1 Corinthians 1.24. Power of God. The Arians put their heads together and again, and they said, yeah, well, that's okay, too. I mean, after all, the wind and the rain are powers of God. The horde of locusts is a power of God. <laughs> and they're creatures. Oh, dear. So, in the end, the bishops could come up with no alternative but to fetch back that word that Paul of Samosata had caused to stink. Namely, the word of the same substance, homoousios of the same essence or substance as the Father. All right, now at the bottom of your handout tonight, I have for you the wording of the Nicene Creed and its attached anathemas. Okay. Now, um, I don't know about you, but I just hate to lose Greek plurals. Okay. Anathemas is the English plural of anathema. The Greek plural is anathemata. Right. Do you all know what the plural of octopus is? No, that's Latin. Octopodes. Yeah, okay. Anyway, anathemata. The council wrote as follows. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of all things visible and invisible, semicolon, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, begotten, only begotten of the Father, that is, of the Father's substance, usia. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Consubstantial, there it is, homoousios, with the Father. Through whom all things were made in heaven and on earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down, was incarnate and became man, who suffered and rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Semicolon. And we believe in the Holy Spirit. Period. End of creed. Okay. Now, as you can see, that Nicene, original Nicene Creed is not the one we say anymore at Mass. Lots of important points about our Lord are, admitted, are omitted from Article 2, uh, like uh, birth from the, the Blessed Virgin and so on. And um, there's nothing about the Holy Spirit except we believe in him. We believe he exists. So, it, but, it, but it was a beginning, and it solved the question what to say about our Lord. We say he's from the substance of the Father and the same in substance as the Father. Okay, now then. Constantine got his money's worth <laughs> from his council. Okay. Here's my criterion for when the sponsor of a council gets his money's worth. That the council doesn't just say nice things in a new way, but also issues condemnations. No anathemas, no airfare. <laughs> ah, never mind. Here are the anathemata from Nicaea. As for those who say there was a then when he was not, and before he was begotten he didn't exist, and he came to be from what was not, 
or came from a different hypothesis or substance, or who say the Son of God is created changeable mutable, well, the Catholic Church anathematizes them. There it is. Okay. By the way, um, I, I find that people have strange ideas about what the church means when she says anathema on somebody. People think that that's kind of like a curse or something. <laughs> it isn't. Anathema simply means we give up on you. You're past our help, we give up. You're, un you're uncorrectable, you're un we give up on you. That's all it means. You're in the hands of God, we give up. That's all. That's not terrible, is it? That's not like saying, go to hell directly, do not pass go, do not go. <laughs> well, needless to say, when the one institution in the world capable of giving you salvation gives up on you, you are given up for lost. But that's now your problem, not the church's doing. Does that, everybody see? So don't be afraid of saying anathema. It's not a mean thing to say to people. Not at all. You don't believe me. <laughs> all right. The, 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 the anathemata you have now read. And you have seen the text of the creed. And you can see that this language alone makes sense of that title whereby our Lord is Son of God. Never mind about being pronounced word. That's speculative nonsense. Okay? Between a father and a son, there's a sameness of nature. Okay? I cannot produce a son who's not human in substance. Not that I've tried. <laughs> but it can't be done. Every beast begets its like, right? The father and a son are of the same substance. So he's not really son unless that homoousios word is truly applied here. Does everybody see? Yeah. Makes it simple. Well, I'm through for tonight. You may have noticed that I haven't said one word yet about the Holy Spirit except that he's not much there in this. <laughs> he's coming next week, okay? Because um, when the Arians started to fall, never mind, I'm not going to tell you now. I'm going to tell you next week about the spirit fighters, and then we're going to get into the problem faced at Ephesus and Chalcedon, and hopefully by the end of next week, we are finished this whole series. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Marshner. So we're going to do six councils in one hour next week, I understand. Good luck. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a short break, three, four minutes. Stand up, stretch your legs. God bless you. To, to use a couple of similes, didn't Constantine stick in his two cents and muddy the waters? Uh, you mean at the council? No, no. After the council, yes, his successors certainly did. No. No, he was all right. He was well enough behaved. Um, but it's, uh, subsequent emperors, Valens and Constantius, were both awful. They were, as a matter of fact, they persecuted, I mean, they were ferocious Arians. And they persecuted the Orthodox so severely that, uh, I mean, look, the mess after Vatican II is nothing compared to the mess after Nicaea. Okay? It was awful. And um, uh, frankly, our bacon was saved by Julian the Apostate. He came to the throne. He didn't care about Arianism or Orthodox or any of that. He was still stuck with Zeus. <laughs> just left us alone. And <laughs> Thank you. Apostate. Yes. 
did uh, Paul of Samosata, did he acknowledge the idea of that inner word at all, or did he only think of words as the external, the spoken word? Well, when it comes to identifying what the son is, uh, he sticks to the spoken word, the speech act, lecte um, energeia. Uh, it's difficult to answer because we don't have much of his actual writing left. We are dependent upon the minutes of the bishops who were at the meeting who condemned him and um, uh, reflections on the situation by uh, um, <clears throat> other writers, mostly from a generation or two later. So, I mean, it, it was for a while pretty controversial what the man had actually said. And um, what I gave you is about as much as we figured out of it. Thank you. But what of the Emperor Constantine I later on, again, admitting, demanding that Arius be readmitted to communion and also being baptized by Eusebius of Nicomedia, not to mention what of the upbringing of his sons? Yeah, well, um, look, Constantine did not have two theological marbles to rub together. He, he didn't know who was right in this and didn't care much. He wanted it over with. And, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, now I, I do not know a story about him, his trying to get Arius reinstated. It's true he was uh, baptized by an Arianizing bishop. Um, but uh, what can I tell you? Um, even St. Athanasius, who was certainly not ironic, was extremely understanding towards a certain party of Arianizing bishops. He thought you could sort of work with them because they weren't the extremists. So, uh, yeah, um, um, I'm, I'm sorry I, 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 did, I, I did not read for tonight uh, a biography of Constantine the Great. If I had, I would probably have been able to get to the bottom of that. Yes, sir. I have a question about the word homusion. Yeah. The Latins use the, the translation substance, yeah. which, which seems to have a materialistic connotation in English, whereas we use the word essence. Would you comment on the difference? The, uh, in ordinary English, you're right. Substance suggests something material. But in philosophical usage uh, in ancient Latin, that really wasn't necessarily the case. Although it was the case for St. Augustine. St. Augustine decided that he, he, he really couldn't believe in a spiritual substance until he read enough Plato. Then he got the idea. But um, no, uh, some of the Latins had this problem. But um, the word substantia gets into this discussion from the work of Tertullian. Uh, writing about 250 AD, uh, Tertullian established the vocabulary for the Western Church. What are we going to say there's one of in God? Answer, substantia. What are we going to say there are three of in God? Answer, personae. Una substantia tres persone, that was Tertullian's language, and we've been using it ever since. The decision in the East uh, wasn't quite so easy. There was a synod uh, in um, Alexandria, again around 262 as a matter of fact, uh, in which the Easterners pretty much decided we're going to use usia to mean what there's one of in God, and hypostasis to mean what there are three of. Then, the floor was open to somebody to provide a philosophical explanation of 
what's the difference between a nousia and a hypostasis. But more of that next week. Thank you very much, Dr. Marshner. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.